It's been about 12 months since I got the Sony a7 III, so I figured if I'm going to make a one-year review video about this camera, now would probably be a good time to do it. But I've already made a review video of the Sony a7 III. I did a three-month long-term review video that I uploaded, you've guessed it, about nine months ago. So I guess that would make this then a long, 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 long-term review video. But in fairness, I'm not going to do a full review of this camera because, like I said, I've already done that. And uh, I summarized this camera as being a great all-rounder camera, both for stills and for video. And nothing's really changed all that much from a stills perspective. However, from a video shooting perspective, there's a couple of aspects of this camera that I now have learned about that I wasn't aware of back when I did that three-month review video. Some of them are good and helpful, and some of them are a royal pain in the ass. This can record 8-bit 420 internally or 8-bit 422 externally. It can record 4K at 30 frames a second and 1080 at 120 frames a second if you're shooting on NTSC. Or on PAL, it's 25 and 100 frames a second respectively. The maximum bit rates that it can record are 100 megabits a second. It can do 4K down at 60 megabits a second, or the 1080 at 50 frames a second is recorded at 50 megabits a second. Now, compared up to the competition, you've got some cameras that can do 10 bit externally, or even some that are starting to do 10 bit internal. And in terms of the bit rates, you know, some cameras are pushing much higher than 100 megabits a second bit rates, like 200 or 400. Now, how much of a difference is that actually going to make? For the general usage that I'm using this camera for, I don't find it a limiting factor. 10-bit 422 or higher bitrate files will give you more flexibility as to how far you can push them in their extremes. For the videos that I'm shooting, you know, in these sorts of scenarios or outside, 8-bit 420 is more than enough. And the difference between 60 and 100 megabits a second, you tell me, because... Like half the videos I've shot with this, I've shot at 60 megabits a second and half are shot with 100 megabits a second. And I personally couldn't tell you which was which. Now, while this doesn't have particularly high bitrate 4K compared to the competitors, there is one saving grace that kind of makes up for it, which is the fact that the 4K footage in this camera is actually 6K down sampled to 4K. So so this is a 24 megapixel sensor, but 4K video is only actually about 8 megapixels worth of information. So quite a lot of cameras will line skip or pixel bin all that additional information that they don't need. Whereas with this camera, it reads the entire sensor, it takes all the information and then compresses it down to an 8 megapixel file. The upshot to it is that you get not only an increase in apparent resolution, you get a much sharper, clearer image, you also get much lower noise because the noise is being compressed down. So the image quality looks a lot better. The downside to it is that it takes a lot more processing power from the camera, which is going to mean, you know, a hit to battery life. And also more importantly for Sony cameras is going to create a lot more heat in the processor and thus the camera gets a lot hotter. Now, older Sony cameras were quite well renowned for almost catching fire when recording 4K video at least not being able to last very long. It's even rumored that the reason we haven't seen an A7S 3 yet is because Sony are trying to fix some overheating issues. But to be fair, for this camera, I've not had any major problems with overheating. Now, a lot of the time I'm shooting in this room, it's a fairly small room. The door's closed, the window's shut, the curtains are closed over. There's a lot of continuous lights around, so it does get pretty warm in here. And I could be filming for maybe 90 minutes or up to two hours sometimes, but it still has never reached the point where it's overheated. Generally, I found if I pull the screen away from the camera to let some of the, the heat escape a bit easier, and I plug in a USB power supply where possible, either a power bank or through the mains, just to take some of the strain off the battery, the camera is able to run cool enough that it doesn't cut out. It does sometimes come up with the temperature warning to say it's getting hot and it's going to cut off if you carry on going. But that still, for me, is set at standard. You can set it to a higher tolerance. And now, granted, I live in the UK and here, if the temperature outside reaches double figures, we think it's summer. If you live in a warmer climate, you may suffer with that a little bit more. But for me, it's not been a problem. 
Now, like I said, that extra processing power does create a lot of heat. It's also going to take a lot more battery life. Thankfully, however, that's not that much of an issue for this camera because this FZ100 batteries are amazing. I can take a single battery fully charged and get probably three hours worth of continuous video recording. And then you've got the option of extending that further by using additional USB power supplies. Now, it's worth noting that you can't power the camera entirely off USB. It's still going to drain some life off the battery, but obviously using a, an, an extra power supply just takes some of the strain off the battery, so it's going to drain a lot slower. Now, along with being well-renowned for overheating when recording 4K, Sony cameras are also quite well-renowned for having apparently poor color science. And if you followed this channel for a while, you'll know that when I first got this camera, the videos that I started putting out with it, the colors were, let's be polite and say shit. It's probably as kind as I can put it. The colors did just look awful. And straight away, everyone was, was jumping on the whole, oh, it's because you switched to Sony. You should have stuck with Canon. You wouldn't have had that problem if you stuck with Canon. It's good because you switched to Sony. And it's not. It wasn't a limitation of the camera, it was a limitation of the moron using it. If you want to see the true limitation of a piece of equipment, you don't look at what the average person is producing with it. You look at what the best people are producing with it. That'll tell you where the limitation of the gear is, not the limitation of the user. And you've only got to look on the likes of, you know, social media platforms, Instagram or some of the Sony Facebook groups and see the quality of some of the video and the stills that people are producing with this camera to know that the potential is there in it. You've just got to know how to extract it. And that's kind of where I made my big mistake. Because, like I said, one of the big appeals for me for this camera in terms of video wasn't just the resolutions that it offered. It was also the ability of using flat picture profiles. Because, you know, I wanted to be shooting outdoors and flat picture profiles just give you that bit more dynamic range for being able to recover the highlights and the shadows a little bit better. The big mistake I made was jumping headfirst into the swimming pool before I'd actually learn how to swim. Because I'd never shot or edited with flat picture profiles before. And then I got the camera and I found the option for picture profiles and I just found what looked like a flat picture profile, started shooting and then found that I just couldn't edit it up to look how I wanted it. Now I did try and alter this with things like creative styles and white balance tweaks but all to no avail. Then I realized the problem that I had was that I was shooting all my videos with my picture profile set to Cine 1. And Cine 1's not really regarded as a particularly user-friendly picture profile to try and edit with. But I didn't realize that I was shooting in Cine 1 at first, because in the menu options, it doesn't give you the option of Cine 1, Cine 2, S-Logs, and so on. It just gives you picture profile 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, which I just thought was the different picture profiles. They're actually presets for a picture profile. It's like a, a header, if you like, and then all the picture profile information is within it. And you can go in and customize them to however you want. So I soon realized I was shooting in Cine 1 and Cine 1 was not what I wanted. So having done a bit of research and looking at different uh, tips and advice from people, I settled on shooting HLG. So pretty much every video that I shoot with this camera now is shot in HLG. Apart from this one, because it's obviously not shot on this camera, it's shot on the A6500, and the A6500 doesn't have HLG, so this is shot in S-Log. But either way, all my videos now are either shot in HLG or S-Log 2, and I've worked out a, a preset for them in Adobe Premiere that I can just drag and drop, and for the likes of these videos, pretty much leaves me with no additional editing to do afterwards. And as far as I can tell, Colors are now acceptable. Well, I hope they are because I've not had any comments from people in recent videos saying, you know, why is your face so red? Why does everything look so green? Why are you an arsehole? That's got nothing to do with colors at all. But either way, either the colors are now a lot more acceptable or you've just got bored of telling me. I hope it's not the latter, but we'll go with it. So I have seemingly managed to improve my color science quite a bit since that three-month review video, which is good. 
There are a few limitations, however, that I've now hit since doing that three-month review video. The first is a niggly one, but could be easily fixed with a firmware update, and I wish Sony would do it, which is the fucking 30-minute record limit. Now, I know 30-minute record limits have been the normality forever and a day. The reason why most cameras have a 30-minute record limit is for tax reasons. I think it was the EU. Definitely some sort of taxation problem that basically stipulates any device that can record video for 30 minutes or more continuously isn't deemed as a camera, it's deemed as a camcorder, and then it's subject to higher tax. So the workaround for manufacturers was to put a record limit of 29 minutes and 59 seconds, so they could still classify it as a camera. However, after this camera was released, that ruling got scrapped, and as such, after that, Sony released the A6400, which doesn't have a recording limit on it. So I was really hoping that with the recent firmware updates that Sony put out for this camera that have introduced things like the Animal Eye Autofocus, I hoped part of it would be to remove the 30-minute record limit. But they haven't. It's a pain, but it's not the end of the world. What could be the end of the world for you is a limitation I knew nothing about until about six months ago. And I've seen quite a few other A7 III users fall foul to this and not realize it, which is the HDMI port. This for me is an absolute royal fuck up on Sony's behalf that I cannot fathom. So there's a HDMI port, so you can use a HDMI external monitor for when you're recording. Fantastic. However, with this camera, if you record 4K internal of the camera, so to the memory card, the moment you start recording, the HDMI port shuts off. Initially, I thought it was a, a physical limitation of what the camera was capable of. You know, it was just too much for the camera to handle. But I don't believe that that is the case. Because this camera is capable of recording to both memory cards at the same time. You can get 4K 100 megabits a second to both cards... Plus, the camera has Wi-Fi, and my usual workaround for not having a HDMI port is to use my phone, is to tether my phone to the camera and use my phone as an external screen, and that stays active when recording. So that's two streams of 100 megabits a second plus Wi-Fi that the camera is capable of handling, but it can't handle one stream of 4K in either 100 megabits or even 60 megabits a second and keep the HDMI port live. But it can do 1080 at 100 megabits a second with the HDMI port. Made even stranger by the fact that I'm recording this on the A6500, which is an older camera to this, like a baby brother to this, and yet this, with 4K internal recording, does keep the HDMI port live. So then I thought, well, they're both 24 megapixels, but maybe it's an APS-C to full frame argument. So I switched this into crop mode, which is then only a 10 megapixel to 8 megapixel downsample rather than a 24 to 8. And lo and behold, it still doesn't work. Maybe it's a limitation at the very extreme of saying, okay, the camera can't do both cards at the same time and HDMI, but it should at least have the ability of doing HDMI and one card at the same time in the same way that the A6500 can. So clearly Sony have made the, an intentional thing of we're not going to have 4K and HDMI at the same time, which is a complete pain in the ass. The only workaround if you want to use an external monitor is to go external recording. So either use something like the Atomos Ninja 5, which will record straight to it, or use a, an external capture card like to this, which I've just got and yet to actually try out, which means the signal would have to go from the camera into the monitor, then out of the monitor into the capture card, which is just a ball ache as well. But it's not all doom and gloom, to be fair. Let's end this on a positive note. So while I wasn't aware of the shit HDMI setup of this camera when I did the three-month review video, the other thing that I wasn't aware of is this camera's ability to do proxy recording. And for me, proxy recording has been an absolute godsend. If you're not aware, proxy recording is where the camera will record two versions of the same video file. You get a 4K version, the full resolution file. You also get a, a smaller 720p file, which is not only a lower resolution, but also a, a much smaller bit rate as well. 
And what that means is when you come to edit, if you're using software like Adobe Premiere, you can tell it you're shooting with a proxy and then it doesn't have to create all its renderings and its preview from the full 4K file. It uses the smaller proxy files, which means it's a lot quicker in editing everything. You still end up with a finished 4K video file, but the whole process of the previews and, and being able to jump around when you're editing is so much smoother. It makes processing a whole lot quicker. So there are some plus points to this camera and there are some limitations. For me, it is still a great all-round camera and more than capable of producing fantastic looking results. But things like the HDMI could be an issue too far for you. But what do you make of the a7 III? What are your thoughts and opinions on it, both from stills and a video perspective? Leave your thoughts and comments in the box down below. Thank you so much for stopping by and hopefully I will see you in the next video.